Welcome to Realcast, the weekly roundup of the real asset markets. My name is Richard Betts, and I'm joined this week by James Wallace, Dan Innes, and Nicole Dines. Um, Dan, let's let's start with you. What have, what have you been following this week? Uh, my key story of the week is the impact of global interest rates on real estate assets. I saw it first really in this story about Brookfield, published in the FT on Thursday, and they've made an announcement that these ultra low interest rates are now actually boosting their asset values. They actually recorded a net loss of one and a half billion dollars in the second quarter. And that might have made you think that they might sell off some of their pandemic hit kind of properties. But in a bit of a U-turn, their chief exec, Bruce Flatt, said on Thursday that he thought many of these assets could be worth more than ever. Um, And the reason for that is, of course, these near zero interest rates. So he, he wrote to shareholders last week and he said that performance was good, all things considered. But, you know, with all government debt now paying you know, almost a nil return, the alternatives of real estate and infrastructure and other real assets has actually become you know, more compelling than ever before. So while the world's kind of searching for returns, real estate is actually pretty resilient. He, he thought that maybe a multiple of 12 to 15 times earnings before interest um, taxes and depreciation is potentially more reasonable. So it could see Brookfield getting a bit of a windfall. It hasn't all been rosy for Brookfield. They've had about $1.2 billion of defaults on their debt on their shopping mall portfolio. And that could mark the beginning of a process of giving some of those properties back to their lenders. My other story sticking in over in stateside was a story from the Wall Street Journal. And it's about repurposing retail space. And it could gradually make its way back over here to the UK. Um, Partly because America's largest owner of shopping centres, the Simons Group, is rumoured to be working with Amazon to start transforming some of their vacant space into some kind of distribution hubs. And of course, let's not forget that Simon Property Group also owns Clepier over here in Europe. Uh, which is a significant REIT. So has Amazon been exploring the possibility of turning some of these department stores into distribution points? It's not quite clear. Of course, over here in the UK, one of the major department store stories that we've all been following has been that story about the John Lewis store at at Grand Central. Grand Central, obviously owned by Hammerson and CPPIB. They're going to vacate that 230,000 square foot store, which only opened in 2015. And that was uh, opened by Andy Street, who was, of course, at the head of John Lewis back then. And he's now uh, the mayor of Birmingham and John Lewis invested 35 million pounds into that into that project but imagine if imagine if there was an Amazon distribution point in the heart of Birmingham that's something to think about. It's interesting I think um, all of that sort of discussion around um, the alternatives what's happening in terms of um, the, the shift from retail towards e-commerce and also a lot of discussion around data centers as well I think in terms of the alternatives um, and the point you mentioned there about um, The capital, I think, related to Brookfield is interesting um, because I had a discussion with Will Rousen, who's the uh, new CEO of GSA Global Student Accommodation. And he was saying that the wind is at our backs in terms of attracting global capital. You know, it's a great mandate to have when capital is flowing towards the student accommodation sector. Um, because A, there's a trend towards alternative asset classes, but also uh, the sector is being seen as kind of cycle agnostic, which is really interesting. Um, James, what have you been picking up? I've been looking at um, Derwent London's results, their reports, their results just a few days ago, and uh, they were pretty robust, actually, compared to some of the other big boys in the UK recently. Their earnings profits of uh, just over 54 million. Um, they still paid their dividend, which is fairly novel this, in 2020. And its portfolio, more broadly, which is heavily central London office based, was only fractionally revalued downwards by less than 1% to about. 5.4 billion. Uh, it's, it's LTV is 17% is very low and between like um, unused uh, debt headroom and cash they've got north of just over half a billion pounds. So but what was interesting as well is, is um, while they do appear for the time being in rubber shape they were fairly frank in their assessment of the markets and it's worth picking out some of the themes that they're discussing and that to, to write to their shareholders and investors. They said that the true impact of the lockdown is yet to be felt by office markets and so we should even though we've just gone through the kind of the worst quarter Uh, in many decades in terms of GDP, there will be a lag time before that's actually felt. I mean, Derwent London says that, you know, if you just think about the broader near-term headwinds, uh, the government furlough scheme comes to an end in October, that's going to have a lagged impact. And of course, we've hardly mentioned this since uh, we've been doing these real casts, but um, the terms by which the UK leaves the EU uh, at the beginning of next year 
will have a big impact on, on office markets. All these things could kind of have a knock on effect in terms of office rents. Um, and just to sort of put that in the perspective as well, I just mentioned that the UK GDP numbers, they came out a couple of days ago and they were as bad as we expected. In fact, uh, second quarter GDP figures were um, minus 20.4% for the quarter. So that's the second successive quarterly economic contraction. So we're in a technical recession now. It, we are expected to bounce back in Q3. The, the, the early indicators are already suggesting that we, we will go back positive. But um, the minus 20% is worse than all of the major European uh, markets. And it's all, also worse than America. So we've had a really bad period. So that, that's the kind of backdrop. Durban London says that they expect rising unemployment and business closures um, which will push up London office vacancies um, and that you know will put up um, pressure on office rents. More broadly, just a final point, they made some comments around the kind of future of offices and of course as an office read predominantly you'd expect them to be pro office which, which of course they are but they did say that you know like like many have before that we'll see this kind of acceleration of pre-existing trends more flexible working offices with increased focus on health and safety more space required between desk and communal areas you know they point to a lot of evidence that suggests that the working age demographics are across a lot of different segments uh, are all very keen to come back to work but the way in which that will happen might be quite different over the medium and long term. Um, I mean, overall, they're thinking about less occupational density per building, and um, so uh, so, that's, so there's some positive um, uh, and interesting sort of developments there. I had an interview with Hans Rensen at AEW. We were looking at Paris because there's a lot of office development there because of the upcoming Olympics and Grand Paris infrastructure project. Just highlighting that their research shows that new office supply um, over the next five years will be less than half of what it was before the GFC. So that's a more kind of positive take on the market um, because in the past, um, when demand was subdued, there were big development pipelines that, that exacerbated the problems with oversupply. Um, so that was an interesting take on it from, from Hans. Um, w- what have you been seeing, Nicole? Well, in Italy, there's, uh, especially Milan, there's a lot of sort of a positive buzz around offices despite uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And the gossip in Milan this week was that Banca Intesa, which is Italy's biggest bank, that might take over this huge new shiny skyscraper uh, that was developed by Coima Res and uh, the sovereign fund of Abu Dhabi in Porta Nuova, which is Milan's shiny new CBD. And that would be Unicredit, the other big bank is already there. So if Banca Intesa were to move there as well, that would uh, obviously be a great coup for, for CoinRS. But uh, looking at the figures, uh, in the first six months of the year, according to CBRE, investments in the office sector were up 7% compared to H1 of last year, which is remarkable considering how difficult H1 was in, uh, in Italy. And the majority of investment uh, took, took place in the second quarter. So there's a real sense of things picking up after a very difficult first quarter. Remember, we, we must remember that Italy obviously uh, went into lockdown long before the UK did. Uh, and got out of it long before the UK did. The investments are very much focused on on the north. Uh, It's not just offices that are going up, but also logistics has seen a 15% increase in investments this year. Again, obviously, thanks to the growth of e-commerce during the lockdown, and uh, with a strong interest from international investors. So, but again, Milan accounts for 80% of those investments. So uh, uh, as we've seen elsewhere in Europe, uh, the investments post COVID investments seem very much focused on, on quality, there's a flight to quality, and there's a, and there's a flight to core products and, and safety. Thanks, James, Dan and Nicole. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we'll take a break now, and we'll be back with our regular weekly roundup of the key themes for real assets on the 7th of September. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.